I just returned from sp spending two days at the uh, International Council of Shopping Centers Asia Annual Meeting in Manila, where we had 350, 400 shopping center owners. And after two days of looking at shopping centers 2020, what are they going to be? At the conclusion, it ended up being exactly where we started with people talking today. It's location-based entertainment. You know, shopping centers need to build communities. They need to bring new people in with all the online marketing. Everyone has come to the conclusion they need food, they need theaters, and they need location-based entertainment that will bring families in and will keep them there. But what is that going to be? It's not going to be the large-scale theme parks that we know today. And in the entertainment industry, recently I met with a group that was put together by Morgan Stanley to talk to some of their you know, top you know, film industry professionals, and they're all talking about you know, where's the financing for our products uh, you know, of the future? And I said, well, wait a minute. Maybe you're producing for the wrong products. Maybe there's new uses of filmed entertainment that you ought to be focusing about that will add more value to the products that you're producing and make it easier if you find the financing and make it more profitable for you. And I think that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, it's not just about making movies anymore. You need to look at building franchises, looking out into the future. What are the uses can there be of all that content that you're developing and new sources of revenue that can sustain the content that you are developing? But many of you may not really be familiar with that concept of what's location-based entertainment, which is an evolving concept in and of itself. So I don't, why don't we turn to the, the guru, Ray, let him set the stage, and then we can begin to explore what the possibilities are and the opportunities. Uh, thanks, Tom. So to lay a little foundation, location-based entertainment embraces a whole range of products. Let me first say that the American studios are very focused on location-based entertainment. Uh, they look at it as, as, as a brand extension, as a, as a continuation of the intellectual property they develop in the films. And Every studio in the United States is focused on a location-based entertainment uh, strategy. What is location-based entertainment? As I said, it embraces, at the top, top of the rung is, is a major theme park. That's where the most licensing revenue would be. But you could also do a land in a theme park or even a ride in a park. Um, then there's branding of destination places and resorts. Uh, there's the combination of water parks or adventure parks, all of which could have intellectual property overlaid and branded uh, in them. Maybe the hottest topic, and we'll hear a lot more about this topic from Josh, uh, is what we call indoor branded attractions uh, or family entertainment centers uh, or boxes. And, and coming from the shopping center world, um, all, shopping, all the shopping center developers in Asia are looking for entertainment boxes that they can insert into their shopping center to differentiate themselves from all the other shopping centers being built in Shenyang or anywhere else. Um, so that's a theme parks at the top, uh, 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 boxes and uh, uh, branded indoor attractions. Also, there's a number of other uh, products that we might include in this, traveling shows and, and exhibits um, uh, you know, through museum cycles and all that kind of thing. So extending, extending the life uh, and the revenue potential of uh, brands, Star Wars touring around to different uh, 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 museums. So that's, that's an overview. That's that there's categorically a lot of those kinds of things. But when you talk about theme parks, and <coughs> as I said, most people want to focus on that because that's where the largest amount of licensing revenue can come because it's the biggest economic unit. Um, you have at the top of the, that rung, you have the mega park, which is now several billion dollars of capital investment. Uh, uh, then the next round, there's major parks roughly around a billion dollars of investment then regional parks, roughly around half a billion and, uh, of US dollars, and then family parks like a Lego park, very interested in China, Lego is, uh, at about 250 million. That sort of covers the waterfront. OK, great. Now, from Ray, we've heard kind of what the US studios are thinking about and what they're doing with their content. Lisa, you're with YE Brothers, one of the old 
largest privately held uh, movie production companies in China. Uh, and I understand that you know a priority for you, likewise, is location-based entertainment. Give us some ideas of what you're doing that's new and original using your content in China. Uh, 呃，现在就是对这个实景娱乐，可能现在在中国也是发展的挺快的。然后我们公司因为华谊兄弟，它的那个呃电影在中国来说是它的IP是最多的，就储备是最多的。但是我认为就是实景娱乐其实它最重要
。那日本的，就是因为我们有一个电影，可能就是《If You Are the One》，就是中文翻译过来叫《非诚勿扰》。那这个这个片子是当年的爱情片卖的是票房很好的。那这个是主题，主要是在呃日本。那可能会有一条街是日本，然后还有一条街是我们的一个电影叫《命中注定》。那《命中注定》呢，它的主题是来自于意大利。我们可能会有一条街是意大利，那这样子三条街组成之后就成了一个爱情谷。那其实这个我我每次听到这个我也觉得很浪漫，我可能会去，因为其实你不需要离开别的地方，你就能看到三个城市的呃风景，或者说甚至是美食你都能享受到。所以我觉得这个概念是很好的。可能我们呃那个会在，因为我们呃今年年底就预计今年年底或明年呢会签二十个城市，就是在二十个城市会。有呃这种电影电影小镇或者是这个文化城，呃就是呃就基本上就是这种概念，就这种模式的。那嗯，这是我们一种模式，还有一种模式。不好意思，就是还有一种模式是文化城。那文化城呢，实际上就是说，呃，可能会盖一些别墅，但是这个别墅它会根据我电影的元素，就基本上是结合我电影的元素。那你进去之后，虽然你住在那个房间里，但是每个房子名称的命名。都是，还有它的形状可能都是依据我电影某一部电影里的元素出来的。那在这个旁边会设，会建有摄影棚。那基本上就是说，可能以后，呃，以后的那个拍摄呀，都可以就是租这里的摄影棚。那基本上我们就是目前华谊的模式呢，可能就是会朝这三个方向去走。可能会有二十个城市，因为现在在中国，实际上每个城市都都希望自己的城市能够带来更多的游客，所以他希望有一种地标性的元素。那现在华谊在这个中国的这个嗯这个电影市场是比较，就是大家都是都是非常有名的，所以呢，大家都希望能把华谊的东西引入到他这个城市，那大家就能够在这个城市玩到一些与其他地方不一样的，所以每个城市都在争，就是可以说就是。很积极的，能够希望跟我们进行合作。那我们也会去调查一下这个城市的呃旅游情况，还有一个人流，呃人流，还有就是消费水呃水准，可能会根据各种因素去结合起来，去到某一个地方选选某一个地方去建。某一种呃，某一个电影小镇，而且我们会根据当地的，就是不同的地方，可能我会建不同元素的，呃，不同元素的一个一个场景，呃，或者一条街，呃，可能都不一样，可能里头还会将来就是里头里面人呢，就像一九四二年的那条街，所有的人穿着是一九四二年的那种。呃，就是那种呃旗袍啊，然后就在街里你就能看到很多人，服务员可能就穿着这种衣服，然后嗯，大概就是大概是这样子的。Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, that's it's clearly an incredibly ambitious project that you have going, you know, with tremendous variety and really nothing like anything else that I've seen, certainly in the United States. Or elsewhere, you developed a truly unique concept. But let me ask you a question. I mean, in one of the, the projects that you talked about, you said that there were villas there where people could stay and they could kind of live the experience. But are most of your projects just solely uh, location-based entertainment projects, or are they part of a larger real estate uh, development where you would also have shopping centers and residential and things of that sort? Uh,我们基本上是，就是我们采取的模式，基本上是那样子。因为华谊，如果在中，就是以中国的这个法律政策来说，因为华谊兄弟它是一家就是电影公司，它是一个轻资产的公司，就是全是无薪资产。那所以
个就是政府支持之后，他会找一个当地的地产商，可能是呃，也有可能是我们来找，但是也有可能是政府，他会有一个合作的地产商或者当地的一个地产商，那跟我们一起合作。实际上，华谊可能采取的模式就跟迪士尼一样，因为我们是有 IP 的。那实际上，这个政府我只需要拿出我的 IP， 然后我收取我的授权费。那可能呢，他希望能够让我们也绑定进去。那我可能在这个项目公司中，就就会成立一家项目公司，专门来开发这个项目。那我可能在这个项目公司中，我会拿一部分股权，呃，就很小的一部分，因为我是不能够去控制这家公司的。那实际上，我可能只在里头会有一部分，就是真正需要花钱的这家公司呢，可能是由政府、当地政府和当地的开发。商通过贷款或者是各种方式，嗯，然后把这个呃，把这个电影制电影小镇或者是这个主题公园，然后把它建好。那最后运营呢，可能就是还是华谊。那运营公司基本上就是华谊来控股，因为呃，因为他使用的是我的品牌。那如果他来经营，他不了解我的电影，他不了解我的创意的话，他可能会导致我的这个品牌会嗯，会会会损害我的品牌。所以基本上运营是我们呃是华谊在控制着的，所以基本上是这么来操作的。对，嗯 ，Fantastic, great. Well, Josh, let's move on to kind of what what you're doing. Josh has projects all over the world,、uh, throughout China, in the Middle East, in Europe,、uh, the United States, and is creating something that I think that is truly unique. To the best of my knowledge, in the scope and scale, and focused on a, a different market than the typical large-scale theme park.、Uh, although it has many of the same types of elements, but at a, a much more cost-effective、uh, way of doing it, and participates in what some would call the family entertainment center business or the family edutainment business. And frankly, having seen many family entertainment centers, they have. No relationship to what Josh does. His is just a different world. So he's got to come up with a new name and、uh, get rid of that、uh, connotation that goes with that word. But Josh, tell us a little bit about what you're creating and doing. Sure.、Um, so as Ray was describing earlier, kind of the different sizes of theme parks and everything, and he got down to something he kind of called the box.、Um, these are typically attractions that are about 5,000 square meters, 50,000 square feet. And we saw an opportunity in the space that you know there's not a lot of people that can build a five billion dollar theme park. There's really only a couple,、um, and we wanted to really kind of own and operate in this space as well. And so we saw that most family entertainment centers that are out there that exist haven't innovated for the last 30 years. In the United States, we have something here called Chuck E. Cheese or Dave and Buster's, which are video games and relatively Poor quality food,、um, you know, that your kids might like, but you as a parent or something might not enjoy going there for very long as well. So we saw a real opportunity to innovate and change this space and create new concepts for,、um, especially for retailers and the shopping mall environment, because as we know,、um, online has changed the way retail works today. People buy from Amazon and everywhere else online, so you're seeing. Macy's closing 100 stores, and Sports Authority going out of business, and you have shopping malls left with these huge empty boxes that need to fill. So, our concept was to take、um, great intellectual properties, so brands like DreamWorks and、um, Marvel and、um, National Geographic, and develop something that could go inside these now empty boxes, basically. And、uh, we opened our first center in Manila、uh, called DreamPlay with DreamWorks, and these are. These are kind of combinations of、um, the best elements of a theme park, the best elements of like a, a children's activity museum, virtual reality experiences, augmented reality experiences, sort of all rolled up into into one experience that would kind of last about three to four hours on average. That's kind of that's our our model. Great. I, I had the opportunity to visit the Dream Play when I was in Manila a couple of weeks ago, and it was amazing just to watch the families. Playing in here together, the kids get into these climbing devices and then ropes, and you know, going across bridges, flying into the sky, and they're just having a great time. The parents are trying to follow follow along, and they're scared to death. They can't maneuver it. They're, they're come on, daddy, come on, mommy, come with me. But it, they get so engaged in it, and that's to me one of the things that I find is really unique about it is the fact that it's truly 
a family experience where they can go and play and have fun and, and you have uptime and downtime and you know real create truly creative. I mean tell some of the types of adventures that you've got in uh, Dreamplay. Uh, so in Dreamplay, uh, some of the activities that you guys can do uh, as a guest are you can make your own animated movie. So we have a whole um, software that we developed and wrote where you can make your own DreamWorks animated movie based on Kung Fu Panda or the new film Trolls. Um, you can build your own dragons, like from How to Train Your Dragon, so kind of like giant Lego pieces. You build a dragon and then climb a tower and then send it flying, so kind of like a Pinewood Derby where you're racing other kids' dragons that they've built. Um, a lot of really kind of hands-on activities um, that we have. You can learn Kung Fu from, from Po himself in a big dojo-like environment where he's teaching you Kung Fu. So it's a mix of physical play, interactive activities, passive experiences like uh, media, like a 4D cinema. Again, sort of all rolled up into, into one. So how much do you use technology, the new technologies that are coming along, either in here or National Ge Geographic or some of your others, or is it more standard, fair images popping up on screens? I mean, you know, to what extent are you moving into the next generation of technology? Uh, so we, we have a studio actually in Van Nuys where we develop uh, a lot of our attractions. Most of our attractions are done from scratch. So we're always looking for, you know, not necessarily new technology, but better ways to tell a story or create a really great experience. So we let that drive us first and then figure out the technology to solve it. And you're starting to see things a lot more like augmented reality, which Michael can certainly talk about, and uh, mixed reality and uh, virtual reality that are starting to permeate into our spaces. Um, and we use a lot of technology in the space, but we also try and make it seamless. And so there's a little bit of a magical experience where you don't even know there's that much technology going on in the box, but we use plenty of it. <laughs> great, great. Well, we've kind of moved on to talking you know, the beyond part of you know, typical location-based type stuff. And Mike, a lot of what you do, I know, is working with and advising companies that are you know, out into the future, looking new ideas. But uh, how much do you think it could be really applicable to, as you say, the film entertainment as opposed to filmed entertainment, not only in the location-based entertainment, unless we're going beyond that, where do you see other opportunities out in the future for the creative types that we've got here who are starting with film and where they can take that? I think that by definition we're talking about high quality branded content, content that's not cheap to produce, whether you produce it in the United States or in China, it's expensive. And with the changes that are taking place in the distribution marketplace for film and all kinds of linear video content, there's really only two places to get your money back anymore, theatrical and then everything else is television. Whether it's television coming through Netflix or through your traditional broadcast or through a cable operator, it's television, and that's it. DVDs, as we understand that that business is almost dead. So the, the creator and the sponsor of a piece of content needs to find additional revenue sources to recoup their investment and make a profit. And those who will prosper in, in that kind of environment are those who can find a way to repurpose, re-engineer, or indeed create from the start content that fits into location-based entertainment definitions of the kind that Ray and <coughs> Josh and Lisa have talked about. And that reality it will become more and more important as these technologies evolve. Let me ask all of you guys a question. How many of you have had a visual reality experience? So about a quarter of the audience. How many of you have had an augmented reality experience? Five people. That's, that's, that's typical. The, those of you who have had it may well agree when I say it's a transformative experience in the way you consume content because it goes from a visual input, watching a show on television or in a theater, to an experiential input. You feel as well as see. And it's a much more powerful experience. Almost anybody who's, who's been through it will say, wow, that was different. I don't quite understand it yet. I don't quite know what it is, but it's different. And as the technology evolves, and we can perhaps talk a little bit, bit about that later, but as it evolves, those experiences will get better and better to the point where eventually the consumer will demand it as part of a film content experience, whether it's a James Bond movie, great example. That franchise has been around for 50 plus years. They've produced video games that are designed to enhance the experience. Perfectly logical to expect that they will do something 
in visual and augmented reality as a way to extend the life of and the interest in the franchise. And I picked on that one just as an example. You can think about watching, say, pieces from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon in, a, in an augmented reality or a visual reality experience. It's, it's a game changer. And, and you can see a day where you'll wonder if people like me are really here. Is he an avatar? We might even have a presidential election where we get two ridiculous characters. No, forget it. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's, good. it's on, well on its way to becoming an embedded part of the business model for anybody who's serious about producing content on more than a one-off experience. But you're an investor. You're looking for new media, new opportunities to invest. What are the criteria that you're applying to the two new technologies and these, you know, people in the entertainment industry, you know, the, you know, what kind of business plan are you looking for that takes you out beyond the original content? I wish I had a real hard answer to that because it's a bit like an elephant. You know it when you see it, uh, but it's hard to describe. But what we are focused on is people who have that long game vision in mind, where they're thinking about non-traditional ways of distribution, who are thinking about both virtual reality and augmented reality as sort of next generation distribution platforms for which they can specifically tailor content to as they make it, and for those content owners who have libraries or catalogs of content where they can repurpose that existing content for that kind of new age distribution. Those are the kinds of entities and folks we're interested in, in partnering with. We're not terribly interested in some person who has the most wonderful idea for a motion picture, and that's it. The single picture investing, single activity investing is not what we're about. What's, what's really attractive to us is someone who's got that vision of sort of horizontal integration across many, many platforms for their content, and also, I may say, on a global basis. We, we've reached the point now where anybody who's creating content and who doesn't have a plan to generate revenue from two of the world's biggest markets, namely the US and China, they're missing the boat. Ray, let's come back to you for a second, because I think one of the things that Mike was just saying about, you know, there's a lot of different sources of content that are out there today that were not typical. It used to be you talked to essentially Disney and uh, Universal if you wanted to have a theme park. And there are a few other players, some of the other studios have been trying to get into that. But there are a lot of other people out there who have content that they're looking to move in out of their basic frame of reference and utilize that and extract value from it. Tell us some of the other players that you're seeing in the market now. Sure. We're, we're Actually, we don't just, my firm doesn't just do uh, feasibility studies for the next theme park in China. We actually do a lot of advisory work with all types of groups, like you say, that, uh, that are looking to uh, maximize their brand and extend their brand. Um, and uh, it's all started with the American studios, but it's, it's gone on to uh, uh, the nature-based IPs like National Geographic, uh, uh, BBC Earth, Discovery Communications. Um, these, these, these groups are looking at, uh, and Josh is working uh, with them. Uh, children's brands, uh, Cartoon Network, uh, children's uh, uh, media brands, Cartoon Network, Sesame, Nickelodeon's very strong. Ardman is starting to get into the business and in, in using uh, licensing their IP to various attractions. You know, the claymation people. Um, uh, the gaming companies, uh, Angry Birds, there's a bunch of Angry Birds kind of playgrounds around the world these days. Um, Ubisoft uh, has got uh, some attractions that they're, that they're working on, even a theme park in Malaysia. Uh, Electronic Arts. Uh, is got some products that they're looking to. And just a footnote on game, game companies. I don't know how many people in the audience are involved in that, but that has been something that has been largely ignored by our industry. Um, you know, mostly we've done movie brands uh, uh, in terms of intellectual properties, but uh, gaming holds tremendous potential in location-based entertainment. Other examples, Cirque du Soleil. We're working with uh, you know, that entertainment company that does the wild uh, shows. Um, uh, on a theme park resort project destination in Mexico. Uh, it'll be a new kind of theme park. Um, the sports uh, 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 groups, uh, the NBA, 
Uh, I don't know how much Josh can tell you about that, but MBA is looking at uh, doing uh, location-based entertainment boxes. Uh, we're working with the NFL on a project in New York that would be a visitor attraction. Um, Formula One uh, is, is uh, of course, uh, and then even products like uh, Crayola has got uh, three uh, locations now where, where there's a visitor attraction. You can go and uh, experience Crayola in all kinds of different ways. Obviously, Lego is a famous product-based IP um, that's in the theme park business. Hasbro on and on and on. Mattel moving in. Hasbro is looking to get into the business. Um, Ferrari licensed the big theme park in Abu Dhabi. Right. We're talking about other ones. So it's a, it's a broad range of, of IP. It's all, it's all the same thing. It's brand extension. It's extending the revenue streams. Great. So from all of you, the things that you've seen, you know, what's good, what's bad, where is the opportunity, you know, where are the pitfalls? I mean, what works, what doesn't? Um, well, there's at least two sides to that. There's what works creatively, mm -hmm. and then there's what works that doesn't work from a business model <laughs> yeah. perspective. And the correlation is not particularly well established in my judgment. <laughs> Eventually it gets there. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Well, give us some examples. Well, probably we should start with maybe some creative examples that don't work, and that, that's way beyond, above my pay grade, but Ray probably has some perspective on that. Well, the one I was going to uh, mention uh, uh, that we talked about earlier is there was a partnership between Sega, the Japanese game maker, uh, and uh, BBC Earth, BBC Earth, uh, a nature-based uh, uh, media group. Um, using their content in an attraction built by Sega in Japan, in Yokohama, called Orbi. Um, 60,000 square feet, 6,000 meters. Um, and it was successful from a business standpoint initially, um, but creatively it had all kinds of trouble because they fell into the trap of thinking that they had all this canned uh, uh, film product, television, most of the television product, uh, that, that just could be thrown into the attraction, into these different uh, uh, environments. And that didn't work very well. The, the canned television approach uh, uh, didn't work. And, and, and one of their attractions within the, the bigger attraction was a very wide screen theater. It was like 128 feet wide. And little tiny television images, you know, didn't really work in that environment. So you have to, you have to make you have to make, I would, I would, I'll ask Josh this, but I think you have to make purpose-built media That's to correct. go into these attractions. That's correct, because I think sort of adding on to that would be the sort of birth and death of the 4D cinema, which was um, a really fun concept. You had 4D movies, you know, where you're sitting in the seats and we can poke you and squirt you with water and smoke. And they were extraordinarily popular when you made an original film. But when studios or whoever got a little greedy about it, and they're like, oh, we can just take this content that we already have and repurpose it for this different environment, that business suddenly, they killed, them. They killed the business by doing that, essentially. Similar thing. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, when you move on to the VR, AR world, uh, what do you see as the limitations and opportunities where it could take and what the problems might be and what is the potential for it that sort of technology, technology to change the location-based entertainment business, or is it a separate business? I, I'd start by drawing a very clear distinction between virtual reality and augmented reality. And uh, for those of you who perhaps don't live with this on a daily basis, virtual reality substitutes our current reality with an entirely immersive experiential environment, blinding you to everything else that's going on in the world. Some days that's a really good thing. <laughs> that kind of immersion lends itself very well to all kinds of location-based entertainment experiences where the environment is by definition controlled, or at least largely controlled. And you can have an immersive experience without danger to yourself, without danger to others. And, they, and, and because you're in a theme park or a, a location-based environment that's themed in some way, your immersive experience is all the more rewarding for all of that. And the business models for that kind of enclosed environment are also easier to implement. You simply charge people for using it. You know, there's all sorts of science as to how much you charge, what's the duration of the experience, et cetera, et cetera. But because you control most facets of the, of the offering, 
there, it, it's not too difficult to find business models that I do think, and Josh, I think you may agree, will, will, will work in that environment. Where it gets much more difficult is when you move into augmented reality and or away from controlled environments like location-based entertainment. And what you have going on right now is a lot of very, very good and creative manufacturers, some of which are powerhouses, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, etc., coming out with devices that are going to have capability in both VR and AR. And, and, and these are very good devices. What they haven't yet figured out, or, and in my judgment are light years away from figuring out, is what's the business model beyond selling you the device? What happens when you start to consume content on that device? And by the way, the content owner is going to have a voice in that decision as well. And, and there's number, there are not any number of shapes and forms the business model can take. A lot of people are thinking about it in the same manner as apps on, on mobile platforms today. But I think, it's, I think the challenges are deeper than that because not everything can be an app. A, a game, and, and, and Ray's absolutely right, that there's a, the game industry is going to be a big piece of shaping this future as well. That does kind of lend itself, the game experience, to an app-type business model. But let's say you've come up with a piece of creative film content that tells a particular story in 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is, or even a full-length feature, that's not a map. How do you, how do you charge for that? Is it a pay-per-view model? Is it a, point is, none of that's known yet, and, and I think it's going to take a while to evolve. The, um, from an investment perspective, we're not interested in, in, in backing the hardware side of this because I do think that the costs of development and production and promotion of these devices, it's going to be a game for the big boys and girls only. It's going to be for the, the Samsungs, the Googles, and others. The content side of it, though, I think will look much more like traditional entertainment content, which there's no limit to human creativity. So those that can come up with creative forms of content that play well in these new platforms, they, they will likely prosper. That, that's a way long way to answer to your question, but I think I could have just said it's still shaking out. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, most conversations are long-winded, so I appreciate that. Well, so, Mike, the, you know, in, in the theme park business, there, there are some cautionary notes about virtual reality applying to theme parks. First of all, the business model for a theme park is moderate price, high throughput. Yep. And the more you absorb people in their own little enclosed immersive environment, the slower the throughput. So you have, you have, to, you have to be careful with that. Six Flags here in the United States has, has uh, come up with uh, in, an interesting uh, uh, adaptation of virtual reality is to slap goggles on people on an existing roller coaster ride and to change, you know, uh, change that environment a bit. And, and that's sort of fun. That's not really a long-term uh, 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 answer to the question of what, how do we do VR in, in, in theme parks. But uh, there are some distinctions there where you have to be, uh, uh, you know, where throughput is important and you're asking people to really slow down and get involved in their own little environment, one, you know, which is a singular thing. It's not a, you know, 1,800 people through, throughput per hour on a roller coaster. But how does that compare? I mean, look, the Pokemon phenomenon is kind of the first very simple augmented reality application that people have got. I was just recently in Tokyo, and I was amazed at 9.30 in the morning, the kids are off to school, and the street is full of moms running up and down and around with their phones playing Pokemon, going everywhere. I mean, whole hordes of them moving around together, around through Tokyo. I mean, it's taken the place by storm. I mean, so maybe it's not the most complex application, such as a Magic Leap is looking at with the glasses and all the things they do. Maybe there's a, a, a initial stage that can really get people actively engaged. And uh, is that a step that you can take? Does that make sense? Who said anything about glasses? Just kidding. <laughs> um, I, Pokemon <laughs> phenomenon. Po Pokemon phenomenon is, is amazing. It's it just taking the world by storm so quickly. It, it, it surfaces, I think, a, a number of useful issues to think about is particularly in augmented reality, which is the superimposition of things that are not real on top of things that are real. And it, it, it's going to cause us all to think about behavioral issues in society. Should you be wearing your augmented reality devices when you're driving your kids to school? Hmm, probably not. Um, all sorts of use cases you can think about that maybe aren't appropriate for certain kinds of, of, of human activity. Um, but I do think it, the Pokemon experience is, is a real window into the future. 
And I do think it has been so successful that it will have the effect, if it hasn't already had the effect, frankly, of accelerating people's thinking about how to position content for the platform. On balance, I think it's a good thing. Lisa, given all the things that you've heard here, other examples of you know, technology and applications, uh, as you look out into the future, as you're doing your long-range future planning and thinking about what you know, Wiley Brothers might use to adapt in to other models of exploiting the, the great content that they're producing, uh, is there anything that we missed, or is anything of this that we've been talking about uh, excite you? Uh. 目前就我们因为因为我我觉得就是可能呃中国在电影方面就是整个产业来说其实它还是落后于好莱坞的所以我们其实还是需要向好莱坞这边学习所以呢我们其实很多模式呢可能呃只是就是呃去学习一下好
，所有的都是以故事线，其实也是有一些场景的，而且是呃，因为它转换到现实的时候，就在我们在在做电影的时候，实际上就已经考虑到将来哪一部分是能够放到主题公园的。那我可以给你举个例子，就比方说我们《狄仁杰通天帝国》，就是第一部，就是刘德华演的那一部呢，它里头会有一个鬼市。那我在主题公园里就会出现一个鬼市，而且就是它里头有一个大佛，就是那个那个武则天，那个就是刘嘉玲演的那个武则天，前面有个大佛，可能那个大佛就会是那个主题公园的一个标，就就会会移植进去。然后它里头有一个塔，就是在里头，就是我记得是梁家辉和刘德华在里头打的那个，其实那些都是可以做成的。就像我昨天去呃环球影城，其实就像变形金刚把你从上面。就拉下来一样，其实你可以就打的时候，你可能也有一种感觉会往下掉，就是它其实都是这样子的。这个呃，就像我们的那个那个呃《非诚勿扰》，它可能只是一个爱情故事，但是它有日本的一个塔，一个灯塔，那个灯塔可能就会做成一个上下的那种。呃，那个、那个、那个机器，我不知道叫什么，反正就是上下自由落体的那种。实际上，它也是，就是，呃，就是，就是我我认为艺术家他那个创造力是是无限的。其实，嗯，都是都是在我们拍摄故事的时候，实际上就考虑到这个后面的了。所以，嗯、呃，我相信那个应该是很好玩的。Right, you might you just might add to that, you know the the. Disney was the classic example of taking old European fairy tales and, and making them into animated movies, and then the imagery of the movie became what was foremost in people's mind, and, and they controlled that copyright. And, and uh, just like, uh, well, the, 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 that, that's the way you, 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 you go about this. You have to uh, uh, create your own imagery with the movies, and that becomes stronger in people's mind. Yeah. Well, one of the things, too, you mentioned the fact that they've created these images. Well, I did, I guess, the first ever foreign theme park representing Oriental Land to do Tokyo Disneyland. Tokyo Disneyland made a huge mistake, and they refused to take the very nominally priced economic interest we wanted to offer them of 10%, which would have been worth billions to them. But what they did do, which was brilliant, was keep all the merchandising rights. They produced and sold and took the profit off of all the merchandise that goes into that park, which made them hugely rich. Understanding the value and understanding the local market and how the Japanese always want to buy umiyage to take home to everybody that they know. And so again, they were one of the first to realize that type of potential of a different element of the content. And first they took it into the theme park in Japan, but then they realized how unique that market was and played to that market. Well, if, if you're a movie studio and you license your IP into a theme park, you get a percentage of revenue from the uh, admissions, from the, from the food and beverage sold, and from the merchandise. In fact, the merchandise revenue uh, royalty is a double dip because you're probably Absolutely. already getting a percentage royalty from the manufacturer of that merchandise, and you're getting paid by the theme park group. So, That's what I always try to negotiate my way out of my clients. <laughs> <laughs>